Hello and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. Today, I'm excited to bring you a conversation with my bestie, Rebecca Altman. Hardly a day goes by that we don't text or call, so we are in constant conversation about life and, of course, plants. One thing I love about Rebecca's approach is her grounded connection to how plants make her feel. She deeply connects with the embodiment of plant medicines. Rebecca loves connecting people to the earth, to plants, to each other, and to themselves. The underlying purpose behind all of her work is to help people remember the wholeness of their being. She has an online course called The Wonder Sessions, in which she guides people to live a life guided by connection to the self, to nature, and to the web of energy that weaves us all together. Rebecca lives in the mountains of Southern California with her husband, cat, dog, and about a million oak trees. Despite so many reasons not to be, she remains steadfastly hopeful about human beings and this incredible planet. Welcome to the podcast, Rebecca. Thanks, Rosalie. That sounds funny, <laughs> doesn't it, though? I know. I, I, was, I, I stopped myself halfway from calling you your nickname. Yeah, me too. Yeah. But for this show, we'll refrain from nicknames and we'll just go with our full names, Rebecca, yes. Rosalie, and we'll pretend that's what we always say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, welcome. I'm so happy you could be on the podcast. Obviously, it's a delight for me to be interviewing you and your brilliance here and sharing that with everyone. I I feel like I get a front seat row to your brilliance every day of my life. Now I get to share it with others. So thank you. That's wonderful. And I'm so grateful to be here. I am not only your bestie, but also a massive admirer of your work. And so it's just a joy and a pleasure. Uh-huh. All right. Well, we'll, we'll just be like all <laughs> lovely <laughs> each other. The whole time. I know. Tell me more nice things about myself. <laughs> tell me more. Well, you could tell me how you got started on this wonderful healing path of yours. I got started like I think many people are drawn to herbs because I wasn't well. And I was in a really, um, a really difficult place mentally. And I was in the process of withdrawing from taking five different psychiatric medications and I was really not doing well. I found herbs in a sort of roundabout way because I had started doing yoga classes every day. And I I'd, I'd, so I'd, I'd, I'd needed a, a very structured routine in order to get through this period of my life. And I walked into a yoga class one day and a man who was lying on the floor, looked up at me and he said, do you want a job? And I went, yeah, what do you do? (laughs) And he was a herbalist and he had a little herb shop in Palm Desert and he took me under his wing and he taught me how to read tongues and pulses and we went out hiking together. And it was actually when we went out hiking together that he would just start pointing out different herbs and he'd be like, oh, that's desert lavender and that's Ocotillo. And it was that experience of being out in the desert. And I started just hiking every day and getting out there. And I think I'm not alone in being a person who sort of starts getting out into nature more and more and realizes how healing it is just to be there. And so it was through that every single day going out to the same trail, to the same places. And then I would start looking at the plants and, and then I would start bringing home pieces of the plants and going on Google and typing in purple flower, palm desert, (laughs) and then scrolling through thousands and thousands of images until I found it and then found the name and then looking up medicinal properties of, and then it was through doing that that I found Michael Moore's books. And at this time in my life, I had no idea that there was a whole herbal community out there. I was just mm-hmm. like 
walking in the desert and picking plants and doing an hours long Google image search <laughs> and then and then looking at their properties and then drying them and then experimenting on strangers like, hi, you don't know me, but I heard you talking about your stomach issues. Would you like to try this herb? <laughs> like, <laughs> Um, and that's how I got into it. And it was really kind of funny because at the time, my boyfriend, now husband, we were living together and I was like going through this phase in my life where I was like, I don't have a thing. You know, everyone I know was in college and had a thing they were studying and had a path, a life path. And I was like, I, I don't have a path. I don't have a thing. I don't know what the hell I'm doing with my life. And he sort of points at this wall behind me that at this point is like full of herb books and jars full of dried herbs and he's like I think you have a thing <laughs> and I was like oh oh I have a thing <laughs> like so I sort of stumbled upon it but happily and this so have you moved to LA at this point at this point this was still in Palm Desert but we okay. moved to LA very soon after that yeah, I, I feel like so. like knowing of L.A. from like Hollywood before I had friends and like an actual knowledge of, of L.A., I didn't realize how L.A. is surrounded by all sorts of wilderness and trails. And so it's it's an interesting thing. So when I, but I remember hearing like L.A. herbalists was like, yeah, how could you live in such an urban <laughs> center? But um, it's well, there's so much plant life in the urban center, too, but also yeah, surrounded by so many beautiful things. Surrounded. That was a really healing thing for me as well, I think, to start um, to sort of transfer that going out into the desert every day to going for walks around L.A. every day and finding things like um, the sort of native plant gardens that people had planted. And I think one of the happiest moments for me was seeing that somebody had planted yarrow and it had spread and you could see like the, the progress of the yarrow down first street which was the street i lived next to and like you could see that it's, it started here and there was a basically a lawn and then you could see like clumps of it as it had spread mm -hmm. year by year and i was just like oh like it's it's everywhere it doesn't need to be in this pristine wilderness out you know two hour drive from here it's like plant life grows that's what it does and that's what's so healing it's like that that earth energy and the plant energy that comes up and through anywhere anyway. um and maybe even especially the like southern that more southern climate because when i visited you i remember i would just walk around and around and around and just be amazed at the roseberry at uh, roseberry rosemary hedges and jacaranda trees mm -hmm. and seeing a flowering jade plant I me mean, it was like i just kept walking for the plants it was just amazing to see so much it's amazing plant life especially when i go down there in like january and it's all covered in snow <laughs> yeah <laughs> totally and the january la starting to come into bloom and the orange blossoms and there's ginkgo mm. trees mm. and sweet gums and like it's it's everywhere it's everywhere. a really really lush city that it's i don't think especially in um in the herbal community i used to meet people and they would be like la yeah that was me <laughs> <laughs> do you need to come and visit? <laughs> yeah, it is pretty amazing. Yeah. So do you remember meeting Wild Rose for the first time or when Wild Rose first started to come into your life? Yes, it was when, it was actually around that same period of time with the Yarrow when I was hiking in Topanga Canyon, which is a canyon that is, I think it's actually still considered within LA city limits, but it's wild um and it's in the santa monica mountains and i was hiking there and smelled it and then went hunting and if i'm being honest the google image search thing is still <laughs> my primary plant identification method just because like so you know how some people learn to type with one finger and no matter how much they write they type with one finger I learned to identify plants with image searches and it's still my like, I know how to use other methods, but it's my one finger typing that is like my most comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh maybe I shouldn't be admitting that, but it is uh Well, there's something to be said for the visual 
I don't, you know, but, the, yeah, the visual, yeah, it works. It's, it's my one finger typing. And, um, and, and that was the first time I ever met wild rose. And then after that, I started seeing it everywhere mm -hmm. because it actually grows in almost all of the places that I hike and have been hiking for years, but it was in Topanga that I first, um, first was introduced to it. And I think it's so interesting as well. It was a, it came into my life, and he, he noticed this. I think, I assume that I'm not the only person who plants come into our lives when we need them. Um, I know I'm not the only person, but and it's it's this such a strange and wondrous thing about our relationship with plants because it's like I don't know. Sometimes something will start growing in your garden, and you're like how did this even get here? I have no idea. And, uh, and then it starts to grow and you find out what it is. And you're like, are you, are you a messenger? <laughs> <laughs> are you coming to tell me something? <laughs> um, and wild rose was that for me, mm -hmm. because I think, um, you know, wild rose has so many different medicinal properties, m many of them physical, but I know that for me personally, and I think quite a lot of herbalists, the emotional effects of wild rose are really um, so profound. And I started thinking of it as like this remedy for, for LA. <laughs> <laughs> because LA is hot and dry and choleric and it's aggressive and everyone is in a hurry and everyone is, um, aggravated by the the other people in the city who are impeding their uh natural fast progression towards something and so everything is uh, like get out of my way don't you know who i am and i am so important and this is really really important and you can see like my face and hands are like getting all tense and my shoulders are getting all tense and that was um me in la <laughs> but also everyone i saw and I found that at first, I think my relationship with Rose was, it was more just about softening and relaxing. Mm -hmm. And whenever I would, I've always been an experimenter and always with people as well. So, you know, that, excuse me, I overheard you talking about your stomach that <laughs> never stopped. And I'd be like, excuse me, I overheard you. Or excuse me, I see that you have very tense shoulders. Will you try three drops of this? <laughs> Um, I started noticing, okay, that was, that's not entirely true. It was at farmer's markets when I was selling things. So people actually did walk up to me. I wasn't completely herb, herb evangelizing, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> just, just to clarify. Um, I, I waited for somebody to say hello first. <laughs> um, and then I would start giving people like three drops of rose elixir. Cause I love low doses as, um, you and I have discussed. Um, and I would watch people soften, like their foreheads would relax and their shoulders would relax and people would start tearing up and, um, not tearing up because they were being, um, made miserable, but tearing up because it's like all of a sudden energy was flowing again. And over the years of working with it more and more and deeper and deeper, because I think it's probably the plant I work with the most. I have started to think of it as a, um, as a plant that reconnects us with our heart, with uh, the heart of who we are. And it sort of relaxes the parts of us that we hold so tightly that prevent us from reconnecting with our heart selves. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think that it often brings such a deep emotional reaction is that what people are feeling is themselves. And if you've been tensing and bracing and pushing and feeling so stressed and so in some ways traumatized by life, and then all of a sudden you feel this, this connection to the deepest, oldest part of you that is okay. And that's like bright and shiny and whole and open and deeply connected to the world around you. There's like, sometimes the only thing to do is to cry mm. um, because it's like a remembrance. I think so many of us need that. Yeah. It, it sort of became 
that that was a journey that I went on for myself and Rose was sort of my um, usher. Hmm. And when working with Rose, how you mentioned Rose Elixir and what other ways do you like to invite Rose into your life? <sighs> My favorite way is sitting with a plant. Mm. Um, I, I don't know if any of the people listening, if, if you ever have an opportunity to go and sit in or next to if you don't want to be stabbed, um, a patch of wild roses when it's in bloom on a warm summer evening, it even the scent mm. does things to you. It's like it unravels your being. And the lived experience of that is, I think, so profound because it really, I think it's it's such an amazing way to show or to see how mind altering plants can actually be um even without ingesting them like this is just sitting in the presence of a being and it's a really small and unassuming being like this isn't one of the power plants that people talk about and think of as like wisdom plants or powerful plants and they're talked about like they're really really important and um and this is just little old wild rose you know it's like scrappy um <laughs> brambly little, scrappy thorny uh-huh it's you know if you, if you approach it too quickly it's gonna kick your butt um and it's not glamorous or expensive or you know it goes in so many different places i've seen it in multiple countries and multiple places that i've visited and it's just and assuming and I think that so the experience of that I think is really incredible but then another way that I love rose is bathing mm. in rose like make a nice infusion of rose petals and you don't need to steep it for very long at all and then strain that into a bath that's beautiful you can add some some you know rose water to it if you want more of the scent if you have absolute or essential oil lying around and don't mind literally pouring money down the drain um <laughs> a couple of drops of that um and like the experience of being surrounded in a bath of rose it feels like a hug hmm. um and then adding rose water to various foods it's wonderful as well. And by rose water, just to clarify, you mean like a rose hydrosol or like the culinary rose oh, water just to. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Clear. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Culinary rose hydrosol. I use a lot. Mm. Um, I mean, culinary rose water mm. that you can buy like at um grocery store. I love that so much of you, what you've shared is like that old, the saying of like, stop and smell the roses. But what you've shared is just like this much, you know, eloquent, deeper, like you could just offhandly say like, oh yeah, stop and smell the roses. There's something about like a saying and then there's something about the embodiment of it. And like, what does that mean to, you know, spend time with the rose? That's so true. <laughs> wow. Never thought of that. It's really cool. And how, we, so there's the rose petals, of course, they tend to bloom kind of springish depending where you live, late spring. Mm -hmm. Um and they are so sensual, so aromatic. And then there's, you know, as those get pollinated and ripen, they turn into these beautiful rose hips. And I know your recipe that you're sharing with everyone today is a rose hip liqueur. You want to say anything about that for us? Enticing words of yumminess? Enticing words. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> um, hmm. The, th the reason that I just paused is that I realized in saying this, where I live here, our rose hips are incredibly fragrant. Hmm. Um, oh, not okay. Fragrance, the wrong word, but they taste very strongly of rose. Hmm. And it just occurred to me that I have not tasted rose hips in other places. Um, so I was about to say, well, you know, rose hips and they taste so strongly of rose. And I was like, I don't know if that's true. 
So that was why I had a stop <laughs> and uh, wait a minute. Um, however, I think the, the entire plant is medicinal and I find that the, like I'll often when I make a rose elixir, I will gather different parts of the plant over the course of the year. Mm. And so I'll gather the rose hips and then gather the leaves and flowers and um, sort of, I feel like that sort of gives a much more complete rose experience. And once I even made a rose thorn elixir, just mm. I, was, I was feeling particularly stabby. Um, <laughs> and, but yeah, the, the rose hips, I think are, I think traditionally rose hips are actually much more used in many countries and many cultures. Like they're easy to preserve. They're, you know, they, they don't bloom and disappear in a couple of weeks. Like they're on the plant for a long time. And, um, so they are in many ways easier to have access to because if you don't actually live next to a patch of wild rose it's you know you're sometimes you can miss it and uh but rose hips are there for a while and they do carry or have the same properties as the rose plant except the rose hips are more nutritional um they have they're very high in vitamin c and I think you are actually probably more knowledgeable than me on the different things that <laughs> are in the property. Yeah, like the property. Yeah, I was, I was like, and then I, I looked at you like, that was right, right? <laughs> Absolutely right. I kind yeah. of love a lot of stuff. Like it's very high in antioxidants. So, oh. um, yeah, beta carotenes as well. Yeah, that's one thing that um, is like a little bit of a pet peeve for me with rose hips is that sometimes people get so focused on the vitamin C that they forget that there's so many nutrients. I mean, rose hips are nutrient dense. There's a lot in there, not just one constituent. So yes, rose hips are high in vitamin C. And if you eat them right off the plant, they're really high in vitamin C. But once you dry them, once you cook them, you know, the vitamin C is going to decrease in each step of that, but that's okay. Cause there's lots of yummy goodness in rose hips, not just like the one thing. So that's just from the physical standpoint, not even from all of the other wonderful gifts within it. And they have healthy oils, right? Yeah. The seeds do, which need to be um, expressed with like special equipment. So that's another thing people will ask, like, can I, you know, infuse the seeds into oil. That's not how rose hip oil is made. It needs to be like okay expressed with properly equipment. Yeah, but absolutely. Okay. Yeah, you know, people love their rose hip oil. I do. I add it a lot to my. I product. love it. Yeah, I use it a lot. Um, wow, that's uh, I I knew that they were incredibly um like incredible nutrition, but um yeah, it's just. You know, I don't remember the things that I read about them. No. I'm trying to remember. Very brilliant is remembering the things that you feel. And um, yeah, it's interesting too, just talking about rows and talking about like that kind of LA syndrome that you were talking about, tense shoulders and tenseness and, you know, hurriedness and all that kind of thing. And um, when I think of rows and rose hips and rose petals, I think, you know, modulates inflammation. That's like the practical side of it. But I can see, you know, working on these various levels, like working with rose hips actually does reduce inflammatory levels in the body, like C-reactive protein. So those are the things I remember. But then it's, you know, from your embodiment and experience point of view, it's this modulating of this energetic inflammation of, ah! I love that. Yeah. I love that. Like the confluence of how these things are, um, how there's like the truth of, the being of rose and then you can look at it through different lenses mm -hmm. and still still find the same thing 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to just circle back real quick to you're talking about like making a rose hip elixir with all of the parts. Like, how do you practically go about doing that? Like, what is your process? Because those parts are ready at different times of the year. I would. So let's say um, I said before I started with the rose hips. So we'll start with rose hips. You gather the rose hips and let's say half fill. No, let's just say you'll fill, fill a jar with brandy. Like you'll gather the rose hips and fill the jar to about half full with rose hips and then fill the jar with brandy or let's say brandy and honey. Mm. If you want specifics, 75% brandy, 25% honey is the, like I'll, I'll mix it all in a giant jar and shake it up and wait for the honey to dissolve in the brandy. And then I'll just fill the jar of rose hips with that. Um, then in six months, when the roses start blooming, I would go and gather the rose petals and pick the leaves as well. If the, if you find when you're gathering wild roses, if you smell the leaves and they smell fragrant and you can taste them Mm. and just like, if it doesn't smell of nothing, basically then gather some of the leaves as well. Um, and you can gather some of the wee thorns as well and put that divide it between two jars and then just add some of the like i've just like split the rose hip Mm -hmm. jar in between these two so then you've now got two jars with the rose hips and the petals and leaves and thorns all infusing so it's just it's just basically like you start it in the autumn and then continue it in the late spring when the rest of it is in blooming, in blooming, in bloom, <laughs> in bloom. I like that you're adding it all together because there's that like synergy and coming together of everything. So it's not just making them separate, but combining them together. And, and I like that you're using the leaves too, because that's not really part people often ask me about leaves and leaves are not something I've really worked with in the rose plants. But now I'm going to go next time I have roses out there, I'll be smelling the leaves and seeing, you know, if if we have fragrant leaves here. I like the idea of just using the whole plant and Mm -hmm. having everything together. Mm -hmm. It's, it's more like the symbolism, I think of it for me than anything is like all, all parts of you are welcome here, (laughs) which I think Mm -hmm. is, um, it's important to me. It's like inclusivity, which it sounds silly when talking about the parts of a plant, but I feel like on a micro level it um when you apply it on a micro level it starts to expand to like all parts of ourselves and other people and I think it's I don't know I like it yeah it's beautiful and for people who want to make something with rose a little bit more simply we have the rose hip liqueur recipe which is using the rose hips specifically to make beautiful wonderful medicine with (laughs) Which you, if you live in the Northern Hemisphere, you should be able to find rose hips now. Right about now. Yeah. For the listeners, as you probably know by now, I love to share recipes when we talk about these plants. Recipes are a wonderful way for you to get involved and create your own experience with herbs. Because it's one thing to hear someone else talk about rose, but an entirely other thing to form your own relationship with this plant through observing, tending, and of course, tasting. And what better way to do that than with Rebecca's recipe for rose hip liqueur. You can download your recipe card using the link in the video description. On that same page, you'll also find show notes, including direct links to Rebecca's offerings and a transcript of this interview. Well, Rebecca, um, still sounds funny. Uh, so just uh, maybe we should, like, we have nicknames for each other. So saying full name yeah. sounds funny. Um, but trying to be professional, which I think I just totally mm-hmm. blew. But Rebecca. <laughs> yes, Rosalie. What projects do you have going on right now with uh, in your life and healing journey? The main project I have going on right now is that I am finally after, oh my goodness, like a, a year and a half of sort of re- reworking it and really sort of taking some time to consolidate and figure out what 
how I want it to look and feel, finally reopening my course, the Wonder Sessions. Mm -hmm. And it's um, it's my main my main offering and my main project and where I sort of spend the, the bulk of my uh, time and energy is teaching people how to connect with themselves and nature and the larger flow of energy in the world around us. Hmm. So I love that. And I love the wonder sessions myself and tapping into what is already there around us seeing that deeper web of connection and how we already fit into it. I think it's really important and something that so many of us seem to forget as we go about our lives and our very stressful business and the that sort of, I call it the web. And I know that there are other names for it in other cultures and traditions, but the my experience of it has always felt like a web. And, and so I call it the web. And it's like this, this web of energy that flows through absolutely everything in existence. And the more stressed we get, the more we um, stop noticing it. And so I, I think it's really important and helpful to sort of teach people to reconnect to it, to remember how connected to it we are and to help people weave themselves back into the, the natural flow of energy in the world. And I think what happens as a result of that is like this remembrance of the wholeness of our being mm -hmm. and feels like important, important things to remember right now. Absolutely. I'm very excited for you in this next offering of the Wonder Sessions for everyone. And before we go, I have my last question that I ask everybody in season two. And that question is, what has surprised you along your herbal journey? Oh, <laughs> how little I need. Hmm. And I mean that in the sense of when I first started learning about plants, I wanted to learn about every single plant under the sun. And I wanted to know every single plant under the sun. It was like, like walking into a party and wanting to be best friends with everyone. <laughs> and um, after a while, like I've been practicing and playing with plants for goodness, how long? What year is it? 2021. Close to 20 years. Um, I think the thing that really stands out to me is that you don't need to have a million best friends. You can have a few best friends. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. just one best friend for everything. For everything. Only one. <laughs> just <Sorry>. me. <laughs> um, but you can have a few. And the closer you become to them, the more you can do with them, the more you can ask of them, the more you, it's sort of like any relationship where it's like the, the longer that you know somebody, the more facets you see of them. And, you know, you can be friends with somebody or know somebody for 20 years. And then one day they'll do something and you'll be like, oh, crap, I had no idea that... I, I just had no idea that you could do that. Or, you know, they tell you a story about something in their childhood and you see them in a completely different light. And uh, plants are like that. The The longer you get to know someone, the, the more that you start to go, oh, wait, no, Rose, I can use Rose here. Oh, I can use Rose here. No, I, can, I, can, I can use Rose here. Oh, I didn't know that I could use Rose here, but Rose is asking me to come and play here, so I'm gonna use Rose here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, so I used to think that I needed a million plant best friends and the uh, the longer I practice, the more that I'm just like five, 10, like I, I use the same plants over and over 
and over and my relationship with them deepens and the it's not that I'm like not interested in new friends but I'm really uh like very very satisfied with the plant friendships I have hmm. oh, I love so. that it makes me like I just have this memory of when I was in herb school back in the day I think we had to do 400 herbs you know in order to finish oh. school I totally had flashcards, you know, and I just um, memorized what was on the flashcard and, and I loved it. Like, I'm not going to lie. I loved it. And I loved that idea of like knowing so many plants, but the practice of it, like those all like that knowledge of memorizing flashcards fell away so quickly after I was like done studying for the test. And really what happened was I, as you so beautifully said, had those deep relationships with a few plants and they're not always the plants that grow around me, but for the most part, they are, you know, plants that I actually get to interact with, not just, you know, order. Um, there are some special ones, though, too, that I, I don't always get to hang out with. Um, but yeah, you just so beautifully and eloquently said that as um, the, the few plant friends, deeper relationships. Yeah, we uh, in Chinese medical school, we had a lot of herbs to learn as well. And I remember just feeling like I, I don't as you've, as you know, and as everyone has just heard, I have a, don't remember details and facts very well at all. Um, but I remember feelings. And so the, the learning of hundreds of herbs was, um, the first time in my life I've ever failed a class mm. <laughs> ever, mm. because it's just like, I, my, my body couldn't learn that many things. And, um, it, it was really difficult for me. So. I just had this vision of like system overdrive or something. Yes, <laughs> like, totally. Much too much. <laughs> like trying trying to taste like 20 herbs in one day. And I'm like, like I, don't, I don't even know what's going on in my body right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, that is a, a wonderful, surprising thing to realize. And one such like born of experience and wisdom too. And I do not like feel bad that I was like really into learning all the plants, but oh. it definitely came just naturally to really focus on on those few so thank you yes. for that and pointing that out yeah and thanks for being here today rebecca and sharing thank your so rose embodiment and wisdom and energetics i really appreciate you taking the time hang out with me i'm so excited to share this conversation with everyone and um yeah thanks so much for being here Thank you so much for having me here on your podcast, Rosalie. It's been an absolute pleasure to get to talk to you about plants. Thanks, Rebecca. And to not use your nickname. <laughs> All right. We'll go back to that right after this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Rosalie. Don't forget to click the link in the video description to get free access to Rebecca's Rosehip Liqueur. Also available are the complete show notes, including the transcript. You can also visit Rebecca directly at wonderbotanica.com. Before you go, be sure to click the subscribe button so that you'll be the first to get my new videos, including interviews like this. I'd also love to hear your thoughts about this interview and your relationship with Rose. Leave your comments below. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks. I'm so glad you're here as a part of this herbal community. Have a beautiful day.